Hello, and welcome to the 2022 Keep It Clean Product Advisory Webinar. I'm Heidi Danchel, I'm the Director of Communications at the Canola Council of Canada here in Winnipeg. Please note, this is a re-record of the original content that we covered in our April 19th, 2022 webinar. This recording will not contain a Q&A session at the end, but you will find a report of the questions that we answered live on keepitclean.ca slash webinar. As an export-driven industry, the success of Canadian agriculture depends on steady and predictable access to major international markets. The 2022 Product Advisory is an excellent tool to guide growers, agronomists, and agri-retailers through the growing season, and this webinar will help explain how it works. Next, uh, next slide, please. We have three speakers with us to provide timely information about which crop protection products may create market risk in 2022, and some more information on how these classifications are made. I'd like to welcome Greg Bartley, Director of Crop Protection and Crop Quality for Pulse Canada, who will review the crop and product combinations that may cause market risk for pulses. Krista Zuzak, Director of Crop Protection and Production for Cereals Canada, who re will review the crop and product combinations that may cause market risk for cereals and Ian Epp, the Agronomy Specialist at the Canola Council of Canada, who will provide an update for canola, along with some important tips on following the label when applying crop protection products this season. I will pass it over to Greg and Krista to start us off with a review of the importance of these practices and the process for to determine market risk. Over to you, Greg. Perfect, thank you, Heidi. Um, so yeah, my name is Greg Bartley, I'm the Director of Crop Protection and Crop Quality with Pulse Canada, and happy to speak to you all today about uh, the Keep It Clean program. So before we jump into the Keep It Clean program, I want to just take a step back and kind of set up the, why the Keep It, program, Keep it Clean program is really here, and, and what we're trying to address in terms of the risks of crop protection products. So it's no secret that Canadian agriculture is export dependent. Canada's crop production far exceeds our domestic demand for food. And the continued success of the Canadian agriculture is reliant on our ability to export. So for example, uh, if you look at the percentage of, of our exports by crop, uh, for canola, uh, canola exports over 90% of the crop to over 50 different countries. If you look for wheat, over 80% of our wheat is exported to more than 70 countries. And then for pulse crops, over 85% of our pulses are exported to more than 130 different countries. So lots of different markets that we're servicing and that just, um, adds to the complexity to some of these market access risks. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So when I look at crop protection products and, and where that market risk covet really plays in, uh, there's, there's three different factors that I want to touch on that's really driving a lot of the market risk right now uh, that's, that's causing a lot of grief. So the first one that's, that I want to highlight is, is really the erosion of a science-based approach to crop protection products in our export markets. Um, I just want to highlight two markets that are, are really at the forefront of some of this. So if you look at the European Union and their, their farm to fork strategy, and even their hazard-based cutoff criteria in terms of crop protection products, what we're seeing is the EU is, is really driving towards reducing their, their reliance on pesticides. For example, in, in the farm to fork strategy, they, they have a clear target to reduce uh, pesticide use by 50%. If you couple that with the, the hazard-based cutoff criteria, so this is where uh, they, they review the, the hazard of a crop protection product rather than, than the actual risk that product uh, poses. Uh, so for example, hazard versus risk, um, hazard is, is a tiger, you know, that, that tiger poses a hazard, but where the risk comes in is, is if that tiger is in a cage, you know, that reduces your risk in terms of harm. So that's just the example between hazard, hazard and risk. So hazard is, is risk time exposure. So at the end of the day, what this means is that the EU is, is removing crop protection products from the market. And as that ha happens, the MRL associated with the crop protection products uh, disappears as well sometimes. And that's what really causes the, the trade disruptions. If you look at Mexico, uh, not, not too long ago, Mexico had a presidential decree to, to ban glyphosate by 2024. So obviously this is really concerning. So the risk here is that if Mexico were to follow through with, with a ban like this, um, there's a risk that the MRLs associated with glyphosate could disappear as well, and that would severe, severely impact our ability to, to export our, our crops to Mexico, so a, a big watch out. Another factor I want to highlight is, is the inconsistency in MRL policies in our export markets. Um, I'll touch on this a bit later, but any time that there's differences in MRL policies in our export market, that just creates this uncertainty. And what that, that can lead to missing or misaligned in our export markets, and, and that's what really causes a lot of these problems. 
The final thing I just want to touch on in terms of the, the risk that we're seeing is commercial pressure towards pesticide-free product. So for example, this is, this is a company, say a company uh, wants to uh, sell glyphosate-free product. So they, they put a commercial restriction on the use of pre-harvest glyphosate saying it's not allowed. That's not science-based. It's not based on any regulatory decision. In many cases, that's just the commercial pressure to, to meet a market demand. And unfortunately, we're, we're seeing this uh, a bit more. So that's, that's really driving uh, some of our, our issues. And it's, it's a, a concerning trend as it moves forward. So we'll go next slide. So to make sure we're all on the same page, I just want to make sure or cover uh, what an MRL is. So MRL stands for maximum residue limit. So an MRL represents the maximum amount of pesticide residues that are expected to remain on a food product when the pesticide is used according to label directions. So that last part is really key when we look at the, the potential risk of, of an MRL in crop protection products export markets. It's, it's really the, um, uh, the potential for residues to remain on a crop when it's used according to label directions. So I, that's why it's so important to make sure that we, we follow the label as the MRLs are established based on proper use. MRLs are not a measure of food safety. They're used primarily for trade purposes. Uh, why I say this is that if, if we look at food safety uh, in terms of crop protection residues, uh, you can see on the graph that uh, there's a couple of uh, areas where something called the no observed, no observed adverse effect level and the acceptable daily intake. These are the levels that uh, could potentially pose a, a risk to human health. And we see that MRLs are established much below these levels, in many cases, 100 times lower than what that risk could be. So it's not an indication of food safety, even though food safety is taken into account when setting an MRL in an export market or even domestically. However, the real kicker here and the thing to take away from MRLs and, and that market risk is that when we export our crops from Canada, our Canadian crops must meet the MRL set by the destination country in order to avoid trade disruption. So even though we have MRLs here in Canada, it's really the MRLs in our export markets that we need to pay attention to when exporting our crops to those markets. Next slide. So I wanna to touch on the MRL policies in our, in our export markets and, and kind of describe why we see some of these inconsistencies. So the chart here shows a, a variety of different combinations of the policies in our export markets. And, and I'll walk you through a couple of them. So the first uh, blue chunk on this graph is indicating the number of countries that defer or have an MRL national list. So a national list of MRLs, and, and that's what they base their, uh, their MRLs on. So this, for example, Canada has a national list. We have one set of MRLs, you either have it or you don't, and we don't have a deferral pathway. So in this example, if we, didn't, if we had a missing MRL or an MRL wasn't in that list, then it'd be either be a default level or it's just not, not there, and that can cause trade disruptions. Another example uh, below that is a country can have a national list, so they have their own MRL list, but then they could have a deferral to another MRL list. So this could be simply a, another country's list, or it could be to the international, such as, as Codex, which is set there to serve as that purpose as an international standard for MRLs. This is a much better approach as if a, if a country has a national list, but there's an MRL missing, there's the potential to defer back to a country or to Codex where that MRL would not be missing anymore. So it would allow for that trade to continue. You know, this, this is really a good policy and we want to see more countries move to this way. The other example in, in the green is, is the European Union. So if you take all the EU countries together and, and treat them as one, uh, technically it's, it's basically the same as a national list. You know, they have one list that they, they all defer to and that's it. So there can, can be some inconsistencies there. Countries could also just not have an MRL list altogether, but defer to, to Codex as a whole, so an international standard. Uh, this, is, this is good as well. There's nothing wrong with this. However, we see some challenges at Codex where we, we are still missing quite a few Codex MRLs, and there's quite a backlog to getting those MRLs established. So it can be challenging if a country simply defers to Codex, as there are some gaps there too. And then finally, the last example is, is a country converted to Codex, but they could have another deferral pathway as well. So Codex is their first, but then go to, say, the European Union next if, if there is no Codex MRL. So just want to highlight here that there's many different policies in the export markets. Um, and, and really, the majority of our countries don't have this deferral pathway. So they have a single source of MRL. And this is what creates the uncertainty and inconsistency in our export markets, and it, it drives a lot of frustration. So anytime we have these potential for a missing or misaligned MRL, that's where we get this possible trade disruption. Next slide. 
So what is the industry doing? Uh, we know this is a problem. We know MRL policies are inconsistent in export markets. We know crop protection can, can pose these risks. So what are, you know, folks like ourselves at, at Pulse Canada, Cereals Canada, Canola Council of Canada, you know, what are we doing to, to make sure that our crop protection used here in Canada aren't causing these trade, trade risks? Um, there's, there's many different things. Uh, the first one I just highlight here is that, you know, we actively monitor the MRLs in our export markets and we work to establish import tolerances when possible. So if we identify if there's a missing MRL or if there's a misalignment in the MRLs, you know, we can highlight that and then work with the product registrants to either apply for an import tolerance to get that uh, MRL raised to a level that's, that's not a concern to trade or do what you can to, to get the residue data and, and get that MRL addressed. You know, that's the best case scenario is to get an MRL in place in that export market. We also advocate for a science-based approach to crop protection products, whether that's domestically here in Canada or within our export markets. Uh, you know, we really want to make sure that the policies that are being uh, implemented are science-based and are, are trade facilitative. So this is really important as we see some export markets moving away from this. So lots of advocacy to, to maintain that science-based approach. We also advocate for a consistent trade facilita facilitating MRL policies or export markets. So anytime we can get that deferral pathway in place where a country is not uh, utilizing a single source of MRLs, you know, we're, we're really working towards to make sure that uh, MRLs aren't a trade concern. The final point I want to highlight that as what we're doing as an industry is, is really providing information to, to growers, agronomists, and, and exporters, or you, anyone in the agriculture industry, just to help manage that short-term risk of an MRL non-compliance. So if we know there's a missing MRL or a potential MRL, uh, a challenge that's gonna cause a trade disruption, really communicating that out to, to the growers or, or anyone that has the ability to, to manage that risk in the short term. So for example, if a, a crop protection product that we use here in Canada may cause that trade risk, you know, communicating it out to make sure that we're either not, not using that product where it's gonna cause a concern or work with the exporters to make sure that if that product is used, it's not going into a market where it's gonna cause a trade disruption. And that's really what we wanna talk about today and where the Keep It Clean program comes in. So from here, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, uh, Krista from Steels Canada to, to walk you through the Keep It Clean program. Thank you, Greg. Um, as Greg mentioned, my name is Krista Zuzak and I'm Director of Crop Protection and Production with Cereals Canada. And I'm happy to join you today um, to talk about the Keep It Clean program and how we have those product advisories put in place. So to start, um, the Keep It Clean program is a joint initiative between the major commodity groups, so Canola Council of Canada, Cereals Canada, Pulse Canada, and we also include the Prairie Oak Growers Association. Um, and really the goal of Keep It Clean is about growing those market ready crops and trying you know, to mitigate those risks of um, market access issues. Next slide, please. So what this ties into closely is on Keep It Clean, we have our five simple tips. And our first simple tip is use acceptable pesticides only. Um, and this is a part where it's important to understand that, you know, we might have pesticides that are registered for your crop in Canada. And although that is important, it's also important to understand that acceptable pesticides extends beyond that. So um, acceptable pesticides would be those that are, you know, minimizing that market risks, or they're the ones that are acceptable um, to both domestic and export trade customers. And, and how we think about those crop protection products we're using. Next slide. So from here, kind of Greg mentioned that, you know, that Canada is really export dependent, um, you know, in terms of our crop, um, our crop production. And so this can really introduce a lot of uh, market access risk with our crop protection product use. So to address this, um, there was a policy, so the market acceptance of pesticide use policy that was developed by the Canada Grains Council. So the Canada Grains Council represents um, grain, oilseed, pulse, and specialty crop sectors, um, and really does represent the full value chain. So Canada Grains Council worked to develop this policy to really be proactive. So this policy looks to be proactive in addressing risk so our pesticide use doesn't become a not another non-tariff trade barrier. Um, if we've been watching the news, we often see these proposed glyphosate bans that Greg was alluding to in other countries. And like this just further emphasizes the importance of that science-based decision-making and forming pol policies accordingly. It's also important to mention that this policy 
uh, the market acceptance of pesticide use policy was developed in collaboration with grower associations, our national commodity associations, such as those on the webinar today, grain companies, life science companies, um, as well as the Canadian Association of Agri Retail Members. This is also a voluntary policy that helps us um, provide some of that um, risk assessment and help us mitigate that risk as we move along. Next slide. So from this policy, what we see is the development of these MRL assessment committees. So each commodity organization, so Pulse, Canola, um, and Cereals, develop these MRL assess assessment committees out of the market acceptance of pesticide use policy. And how these are formed is essentially what we, we have is all the members of the value chain sitting down together at the table um, to help assess these risks of crop chemistries or crop use patterns. So we see on here, we have the Western Grain Elevator Association, we have crop life registrants, we have car, we have grower representatives, and everyone is really sitting down at the table to be conducting these assessments, um, and they are led by the Commodity Association staff that are on this webinar. Next slide. And what we do with this policy and how we build this together as a, a national commodity group when we get together with our assessment committee is we kind of go through three steps that really help um, determine market risk. So we start off with markets of interest, which we'll get into a little more detail about, but essentially these are kind of key countries um, that we export to and, and how we work with those and how their MRL or their risk levels work. From here, we also look into pesticides of interest, which we'll get into more detail about how we determine um, which pesticides we review. And it is a lot dependent on um, which pesticides have residues that might be a trade problem. And then from here, we use all of this information together to really try to assess this level of risk um, and make a determination as a committee together. Next slide. So our markets of interest, when we look at this, we kind of break it into four parts by the policy. Um, the first part of markets of interest is the standard setters or policy leaders. So these are kind of thought to be um, kind of the key influencers. And so these are, you know, some of our major markets or as Greg talked about, codex that are included in this. The second group we look into are those countries or those markets that are undergoing um, policy change. So changing their MRL policies, and this is something we definitely want to keep an eye on. So these would be countries like South Korea or China. Third, we have our major export destinations. So here um, it changes a little bit because sections three and four, these are specific to the commodity that we're thinking about. So with major export destinations, um, these are markets that average more than 5% of exports um, over the last three years. And these are determined um, by the commodity. When we move into four, which is the significance of the value chain section, what we see here is markets with export potential um, that are identified by the Commodity Association as well as the CGC MRL committee. And these are markets that contribute more than $50 million per year, averaged again over three years, and they're specific to each commodity. Next slide. So how do we determine those pesticides of interest we talked about? So what we see here is kind of like the inverted or like a funnel analogy that we look at um, to determine where we really go. So we do start with the full list and this would be you know, new pesticide registrations um, or those that we you know, had a closer eye on in previous years. And we funnel it down with a series of exclusions to get down to what we look closely at. So first of all, those that have a Canadian MRL that is set quite low at 0.01, um, those are excluded. So essentially those are considered um, not to have a residue concern. From there, we move down um, to exclude those that don't have a tight MRL. So a tight MRL would be a market where um, you know, we have pesticides with MRLs that are at or below the MRLs in the market of interest um, when we think about Canadian MRLs. From here, that's where we review some of that residue data and we are excluding pesticides that don't have any residues detected in the commodity. And finally, we have our last exclusion criteria, um, which would be limited acres. So if we have less than 5% of acres, we also exclude that due to limited use. And then those pesticides of interest essentially are what are left after going through um, the funnel. And those are the ones that we assess as a committee. Next slide. So determining risk, this is a bit of an interesting factor. Even though we have a policy developed and a process that we follow, um, there are definitely 
other considerations to be made. So we kind of break our acceptability of risk into um, three. So the first would be that likelihoods are controlled by this crop protection product. And are there other marketed products that could also um, control this pest? Or is this something quite novel? It's a consideration to be made, um, as well as handling and shipping. So thinking about bulk versus containerized shipping um, or regional concentrations, or depending on where it's being used. And finally, it's kind of also dependent on um, destination and end use. So when we think about, you know, commercial compliance and use, um, as well as blending or mitigation factors that might be part of it. Next slide, please. And then this brings us to our product categorization. So what we see here is sort of like a traffic light analogy where we have green, amber, and red. So where green is a go, this is no, re um, no recommendation. So this would be where, you know, we have kind of, I guess we'd call it like an acceptable level of risk about MRL related trade disruption or, you know, this likely or unlikely to be problematic residues or, you know, um, there are good alignment with MRLs as Greg was talking about. Versus when we get to the amber category, we move to a B informed. So this is where we have to start being a little more cautious. This kind of an advisory requires a little more um, communication with your grain buyer, for example, because treated grains may not be accepted by some exporters. And we also have to think about, um, you know, what that means for that crop or chemistry use pattern and really being sure we're in good communication with our grain buyer before we use that product um, on that specific crop type. And finally, we get to our red, which is our do not use. So this is um, kind of the top category where it considers an elevated risk of an MRL related trade disruption. Um, this would be generally that this, you know, chemistry and crop use pattern would not be accepted by grain exporters. Um, and this is where we would form an advisory that growers are advised um, not to use this chemistry or crop use pattern to be, you know, avoiding those market access risks because there is definitely a risk present that's been assessed by the committee. Next slide, please. And then finally, this is what forms your keep it clean advisory. So we're going to go through them for each commodity after this. But when we look at our um, 2022 product advisory, you can see the um, amber, red, and green categories that are on there by the different crops, um, as well as some comments. Next slide, please. So where we're going to go from here is I'm going to present on the 2022 product advisory for cereals and the updates we're seeing for this growing season. Next slide. So the first product to talk about today on cereals is Chlormaquat. Um, so Chlormaquat is not new to the advisory this year, and Chlormaquat continues to pose a market access risk on barley um, due to MRL misalignments in export countries. So as, as a result, we do have kind of a potential MRL um, risk for barley treated with Chlormaquat, and it has an amber designation for both malt barley as well as barley, which highlights the importance of um, consulting with your grain buyer before using this product on barley that is for malt or that is for food or feed. And Chlormaquat does have a green advisory, so no recommendation on oats as well as wheat. Next slide. Now, the next ingredient we're going to talk about for cereals today is pre-harvest glyphosate. So again, not a new advisory for 2022. Um, glyphosate is maintaining the amber classification or be informed on oats, wheat, and barley that is for food or feed, and a red categorization for malt barley. Um, again, you should be consulting with your grain buyer before using glyphosate on oats, wheat, or barley. Um, and just keep in mind that glyphosate should not be used on malt barley because of that red designation. When the use of glyphosate is allowed, keep in mind it's registered as pre-harvest weed control agent and not as a desiccant. And really to further reduce the risk of unacceptable residues in harvested grain, this is an important time to remember that tip of follow the label um, and really only use pre-harvest glyphosate when your grain moisture is less than 30%. And this would be in the least mature part of the field. So when we think about a year like we saw last year with having some drought and maybe some late season moisture in certain parts, um, we might see regrowth that could potentially 
um, produce seed. And this is an important time to think about, you know, um, the secondary growth could um, cause some issues in some, some of our cereal growing regions and have kind of an elevated risk for um, MRLs with pre-harvest glyphosate use. Next slide. Salflofenacil or heat as one of the products um, is our next advisory um, for cereals. It's not a new advisory for 2022. This is the continuation um, from years previous. And one of the important parts to highlight for safflofenacil as well is uh, the risk on malt barley. So malt barley will not be accepted by grain buyers if it is treated with safflofenacil due to negative effects on the malting process. However, it is acceptable on food and feed barley and it is also um, approved for use on wheat. Next slide. So our final, um, product advisory for cereals for 2022 is a new product advisory. So what we're seeing here is um, fluopyram. So fluopyram is a new chemistry that was um, added to the product advisory after review by the Cereals MRL Assessment Committee for the uh, upcoming growing season. And what we see is using fluopyram can pose a market access risk for malt barley um, due to MRL related risks in some major markets. Um, Really, if you're thinking about using fluopyram, it is a no recommendation, so it is good to go on wheat. However, when you look at malt barley or barley for food and feed, um, barley treated, pardon me, barley treated with fluopyram uh, for food and feed may not be accepted by all grain buyers. So it's important to have that um, communication to confirm your contract terms and acceptability before using this fungicide. And then when we look at malt barley, it is a do not use as it does have a, a red advisory on it. And grain buyers will not accept malt barley that is treated with fluopyram. So thank you very much for joining me for um, the Cereals Canada product advisory on cereals for 2022. I'd now like to turn it back over um, to my colleague, Greg Bartley for the update on pulses. Great, thanks Krista. Um, yeah, so I'm going to run over uh, the, the pulse classifications that we'll find on the advisory for the 2022 growing season and, and hopefully provide a bit of comments on, on why we see, see some of these products on the advisory. So first one I want to jump into is, is it's a new one for, for this year. So it, this is something we don't want to do. No, I think the goal is to, to not have any products on this advisory. It's, it's not our goal to be producing advisor every year. However, when these market risks are identified, it's important to communicate them out to growers so we can try to avoid them. So new for this year is the herbicide cethoxidum. So this is post-ultra. And as you'll see, it's a, it's a yellow classification for lentils and chickpeas. So the reason why cethoxidum has been added to the advisory for this year is really to the European Union. So the EU is anticipating to change the MRL, lower the MRL and change the residue definition for cethoxidum. And this would drop the MRL to a default level of 0 0.02 parts per million for all pulse crops. So a, a very low MRL. The challenge with this one though, is that we don't know the timeline for when the EU is gonna make this change. So all we know is that when this change may happen or when it happens, we'll probably have about six months uh, from the time that decision is made to when that emerald falls. So this was a challenge when growers are going to apply this product in the growing season, but then, you know, say we just apply it to then six months later, uh, or the EU makes a decision and then six months later, uh, the MRL falls, you know, that's right in the middle of when we're exporting our grain and we can't make, you know, can't get that back. So working with BSF, uh, we've made the proactive decision to uh, put this on the advisory and, and suggest not to use Cethoxum if, if the lentils and chickpeas are going to be exported to the European Union, just to make sure that we're not going to cause this trade disruption. So to clarify, and you know, since it was really proactive, BSF has been proactive too. And all of the Solo Ultra and Odyssey Ultra NXT co-packs that you typically find on the market, so at your retail locations, the Cethoxum's already been removed from those, those, those co-packs uh, for this growing season. So uh, there's no, no action needed at this point. Uh, the retails have been updated with, with a new product that doesn't have the Cethoxum. What the, the message really here is, is for growers that may have uh, these coal packs uh, currently on farm and carried over from previous years, you know, this is really getting the message out there that um, you need to talk to your buyer before using uh, that on lentils and chickpeas to make sure it's, it's not going to be a concern. 
or potentially just apply uh, that, that product to a different crop, such as peas or, or something else where we have identified that that trade risk just isn't the same for lentils and chickpeas. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So the next one on the advisory is, is when we started to communicate last year, and this is the fungicide chlorothlonol. So we have it uh, categorized as a, as a yellow bee informed for chickpeas, and it, we're really encouraging growers to, to talk to their buyers before using chlorothlonol on chickpeas uh, uh, this growing season. So the reason why chlorothlonol is being added to the advisory is, again, to the European Union, uh, as the EU has revoked the MRLs for chlorothlonol, so they've dropped to a default level of 0 0.01 parts per million. If you look at the, the difference between MRLs between Canada and the EU, uh, we can see that uh, the MRLs for chickpeas is established at seven parts per million in Canada. When you compare that to the 0 0.01 parts per million in the EU, you can see it's quite the difference. So we've identified this as a potential uh, market risk. However, we're, we're still trying to gain a little more information on the true level of risk it shows. So we have we've have some indication that it, it may be a risk, but there's also some indication that you know it may be fine too. So what we're really encouraging you is to, to talk to your grain buyer before using this product. And uh, at Pulse Canada, we will continue to, to monitor this to, to help gauge that true level risk and see if we can provide a better recommendation in the future. I also want to highlight here that uh, domestically, the, the pest manager regulatory agencies, so the PMRA, um, has proposed to cancel all outdoor uses of chlorothalonal. So this is super concerning, especially for our chickpea growers, where this is a, a really important product uh, to, to the chickpea growers. So I just want to highlight here that Pulse Canada is working as, as much as we can to support the continued use of this registration. Uh, to make sure that's still available as chickpea growers, as we, we know it's, it's a key product that's, that provides a lot of value. Next slide. The next product I want to uh, highlight here is, is glufosate ammonium. So I'm first going to start off and say there's, there's a difference in registration for glufosate between Western and Eastern Canada. So for Western Canada, you can see that there is a registration for a glufosate product for, as a desiccation on lentils. And it's not registered, registered for use on any other pulse crop in Western Canada. So as you can see, it's classified as this red do not use for lentils in Western Canada. And this is really for the, the MRL misalignment in our export markets. If we look at the table below, you can see that we, in Canada, we have an MRL established at six parts per million. But if you look at our codex MRLs and US MRLs, there, there is no MRL established at all. So it's, it's missing. It's, it's not there. If you look at where emeralds are established, you can see it's 0 0.03 parts per million EU. So again, the super low level and two parts per million in Japan. So what you really wanna ha highlight here is that the trade risk is, is really high. It's really elevated. So uh, really trying to encourage growers or telling growers, just please do not use this product as it's almost certain that if this product does get used and it's exported to export markets, we will have a trade concern. So it's, it's important to, to follow this advisory and, and note that some buyers just will not accept lentils treated with glufosinate. If you look at Eastern Canada, you can see the difference in registration where there is a registration on dry beans, but no other pulse crops. And we have this classified as a yellow be informed. Now, the reason for the difference in classification and, and why it's yellow in Eastern Canada is that uh, that the MRL situation, you know, in our export markets is, is quite similar. You know, in many cases, it's it's still very low or, or missing MRLs. However, the, the one to highlight here is that that established MRL in Japan at two parts per million. What that allows is, is certain types of market classes of our dry beans that's important or that are being exported to the J Japan market does allow for a safe use of this product that won't cause trade concerns. So, Really encourage growers to, to talk to a grain buyer to, to make sure it's acceptable for use uh, before, before you apply this, as it's important to know that it, it does serve a purpose for some market classes going into the Japanese market, but other market classes, it's, it's going to cause trade concerns. So we need to be aware of that. Next slide. The final product we want to touch on for on the pulse uh, classifications is, is pre-harvest glyphosate. So I just want to start off here and, and indicate that, um, you know, we've had a couple of changes in the MRL situation since uh, last year when I provide this update. So the first is, is good news. Um, we, we've been waiting to have a, a glyphosate MRL established at Codex for some time, as this addresses a, a missing MRL for, for chickpeas and fab beans. So uh, these MRLs are now established, and you can see that MRLs are established for all pulse crops at Codex at, at 10 or 15 parts per million. So this is really good news. 
However, what you're going to see is that glyphosate still remains as this yellow, yellow classification for all pulse crops, uh, with the exception of red lentils, uh, due to the market acceptance uh, issues associated with PRS glyphosate. So what does this mean? So you can see that we have this MA notation that indicates market acceptance. And this is where, you know, we're indicating that the emeralds are established. You know, in many cases, they're established at higher levels than, than here in Canada, which is a good scenario. But we still see potential trade concerns. You know, glyphosate is highly scrutinized in the global market, and we are aware of some green buyers that do have restrictions. So uh, just communicating out there that there, there is a potential for that market risk and, you know, just encouraging growers to, to have that conversation with a green buyer uh, before using PRS glyphosate, just to make sure it's acceptable for, for the end use markets and, and the markets they're trying to get into. Uh, you'll notice that difference in red lentils, where is that green classification? This is really trying to, to make sure we're up to date and, and uh, providing a, a clear direction to farmers where, and listening to feedback too. Um, you know, when we hear from farmers in terms of uh, this advisory and, and the classifications, you know, the feedback we received is that um, if farmers are going to talk to their green buyers and weren't hearing of restrictions on red lentils for group life state. So in order to, to remain up to date and, and, and indicate that there may be differences uh, for lentils in export markets, uh, depending on the market it goes to, we've updated to a green classification uh, indicating that, you know, there are no major market risks identified, uh, even though, you know, there may be some just with, with glyphosate in general. But at the end of the day, um, we're seeing that uh, it's just not enough to, to be communicating that uh, to talk to a grain buyer. That being said, I think the, the key takeaway message that we always want to drive home is that if you are going to use pre-harvest glyphosate, uh, make sure it's used properly. So just highlight again that glyphosate is registered for pre-harvest weed control and it's not to be used as a desiccant. Super important. Uh, the 30% moisture content is absolutely critical to make sure our residues remain in line. So again, if you're using the product, make sure it's used properly for that pre-harvest weed control and make sure when you apply it, it's at less than 30% in all areas of the field to make sure it remains acceptable uh, levels. Next slide. From here, I'm gonna pass it over to Ian at the Canola Council of Canada to take it from here. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. I am gonna go through the 2022 product advisory for canola. And as you can see on the screen there, it is a good one or a bit of a good news story. We have no markets for concern or products right for registered on canola. So if it's registered on canola in 2022, uh, it is acceptable to use. So all of our products are green, which is a really good news story. Uh, you know, lots of MRLs do change year to year and we monitor them very closely, but this year, again, for the second year, we don't have any that are uh, causing us grief or so they are all aligned with Canadian MRLs. Uh, next slide, please. So that being said, even though all of our products are green, it's still really important. The whole framework that is set up that's been described by Greg and Krista talks about MRLs being aligned or setting the MRLs. This is all dependent on products being used as per the label. So your crop protection guide in each province following those labels. So I'm going to go through a few of those things to keep in mind, top tips to keep in mind as you're going through the growing season, maybe areas of concern we've had in the past, and just ways to make sure that once you get to market, your products are good to go. So the first one is rate. We really need to stay on the right rate. Rate is often very directly correlated with residue, right? So using the highest label rate, the MRLs that have been established here in our global export markets, they're based on using the highest rates. So if we, if, as long as we're using that, no, not exceeding that maximum rate, we're not gonna have residue problems. Uh, timing, you know, the right window on the label. In most cases, this doesn't necessarily, if you're applying, you're applying at the right timing and for an agronomic reason that also fits why we're doing it, but just realizing that off-label applications, especially late applications can run us into grief. Uh, next slide. Um, timing, you've already heard about glyphosate. Uh, glyphosate's the poster child. It's a lot of scrutiny globally. Um, in canola as well, as you've already heard in the other pro commodity products, that 30% uh, less moisture is really important, especially in the least mature part of the field. And again, in a lot of years in a really even part uh, field, that's not that hard. If you have a crop year like last year where we had really stagey crops, maybe some second growth going on, that can be really challenging. But keep in mind that it's essential that we're talking about 30% in the least mature part of the field. Uh, next slide. And then the last thing that can have a big influence on the amount of residue is the pre-harvest interval. So the, the time from when you actually apply the product to swathing or harvesting of the crop. Uh, you know, the shorter the pre-harvest interval, quite often we can have some larger residues in, in, in a lot of cases. Uh, so in, 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 for uh, early season uh, 
pesticides, this generally isn't a problem. Where we can run into some grief is those out of season or out of normal late season applications. So glyphosate, we've already talked about maybe uh, some of the desiccants, but especially insecticides. We're not planning to often to uh, apply a late season insecticide. It's not in our crop plan, but you know, we have some late season insect, we hit, we hit a threshold, we trigger an insecticide application for you know, a diamondback moth or something that's, we don't do that regularly. There's a huge window or a huge variance in the pre-harvest intervals of insecticides, for example. So some of them can have zero or one day uh, pre-harvest intervals, and some of them can be 60 days. Even though all of the, uh, you know, four or five products might be registered for control of a pest, you might have to really be narrowing down depending on when you think you're gonna harvest it. So just something to keep in mind as you get into the season, or if you're making a outside of normal uh, insecticide or pesticide application, keep in mind that this pre-harvest interval can be kind of sneaky, but there are always products acceptable, just might limit your options a little bit. Uh, if you're looking for more information on that, as you can see on the screen there, there's a spray to swath interval calculator. So you throw in your crop type, you throw in your uh, uh, pesticide that you're looking to use, and it'll tell you what the pre-harvest interval is. So really easy to use, something just keep in the back of mind as you're making uh, pesticide applications this season. Next slide. I'm going to turn it back over to Heidi. Great. Thanks, Ian, and thanks to all of our speakers um, for their presentations today. That concludes our 2022 product advisory webinar. So just as a quick reminder, this, rec this recording was a re-record of the webinar content, so it won't contain a Q&A session. However, we've created a report with all the questions that were asked during the live webinar on April 19th, and you can view this report on our website at keepitclean.ca webinar slash webinar. Another quick note is that um, Keep It Clean will be hosting another webinar later this summer, and that one is going to be focused on pre-harvest tips and tools. So I hope everyone can join us for that one as well. If you haven't already done so, you can sign up to receive the monthly um, email updates from Keep It Clean, and that'll include invitations to register for our upcoming webinars, and you can sign up on our website at keepitclean.ca. So on behalf of Keep It Clean, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again soon.